Hello, and welcome to our podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Travels hostess. Tonight, I am joined with Serial Killers with Sierra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a few minutes. It, it has been a minute. I think my last episode was uh, Mr. Albert Fish. Yes. 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 And you've been busy. Oh, yeah. Some changes in your life. Yeah, I got a... My, my first own place, right? rental, by myself. How's that going? I have spent a total of two nights <laughs> in that house, <laughs> and I have had it for like a month. <laughs> I'm currently on an air mattress in my mom's house. Change is hard. It okay. is, and I don't have internet. So oh, like, okay. Eh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got a call. I've been putting that off. Right. Responsibilities are hard. Yeah, and then we've been dealing with the ramifications of a hate crime at my work, so that's fun. Too. Right. Yeah. Right. But I hear for the dark corners are donated some donuts, some delicious donuts to cheer people we up. Did and it w- went over really, really well. It was good. So okay, well, I'm glad about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some gruesome stuff because that's Ooh. not you know who needs that in their life. Me all day, every day. Okay. So, what are we talking about today? We are talking about the Axeman of New Orleans. Okay. So, as the name implies, the victims usually were attacked with an axe, which often belonged to the victim themselves. That is not like a slap in the face on top of everything else. I know. I know. And then, like, my new house has wood stove for heat, so I have an axe now, and I'm like, oh. Right. <laughs> It could be me. Right. (laughs) In most cases, a panel on the back door of a home was removed by a chisel, which along with the panel was left on the floor near the back door. So he was leaving evidence behind. Yeah. And yet this man was never caught. Oh, okay. You know, I wonder, do they still have? Do they, have they kept? I would hope so. Because I mean... I wonder if it has DNA evidence on it now. Or something. Fingerprints, something. Right. Okay. Who knows? So, wait, when are we talking here? So, he was active between May 1915 and October 1919. So, my God, we're talking over 100 years ago. Over 100 years ago. This man terrorized New Orleans and the surrounding communities. Okay. The intruder then tacked one or more of the residents in the home, either with an axe or with a straight razor. The crimes, however, were not motivated by robbery, and the perpetrator never removed any items from his victim's home. So I guess the point was killing. Yeah. He just did it to do it. See if they can do it. Okay. Yeah. The majority of the Axeman's victims were Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, leading many to believe that the crimes were ethnically motivated. That is a sinister possibility. Well, back, you know, especially back then, I was kind of par for the course, really. Racism? Okay. Well, it was. It hasn't stopped yet. No. But I'm saying it was, like, more socially acceptable back then. Well, not that we're saying that was okay. No, I'm not saying it's okay, but I'm just saying it's... Right, it was something that... People were more bold. Well, I don't know. People are pretty bold with it now. Yeah. Stupid people, but, you know. Right. Many media outlets sensationalize this aspect of the crimes, even suggesting mafia involvement, despite the lack of evidence. Well, if it, I mean, that's their go-to for Italian Americans. Yeah. And any type of violence. Oh, it's the um, the mafia. The mafia. The mob. Some crime analysts have suggested that the killings were related to sex and that the murder was perhaps a sadist, specifically seeking female victims. Were the victims predominantly female? Predominantly, but there was quite a few male victims as well. Okay. You're going to go into? Yes. Okay. 
Criminologists Colin and Damon Wilson hypothesize that the Axemen killed male victims only when they obstructed his attempts to murder women, supported by cases in which women of the household were murdered but not the man. A less plausible theory is that the killer committed the murders in an attempt to promote jazz music, suggested by a letter attributed to the killer in which he stated that he would spare the lives of those who played jazz music in their homes. (laughs) You have to overcome things with the power of jazz. Apparently, where's Charlie Parker when you need him? Shit. He was not caught or identified, and his crime spree stopped as mysteriously as it had started. Do we suspect something happened to him he went to prison for unrelated reasons so one of the theories is that he himself got murdered okay i'll get into that here in a little bit okay march 13th 1919 a letter purporting to be from the axeman was published in newspapers saying that he would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight on the night of march 19th but would spare the occupants of any place where a jazz band was playing that night all of new orleans's dance halls were filled to capacity and professional and amateur bands played jazz at parties at hundreds of homes around town no murders happened that night. So he, she kept her, their word. Yeah. The letter reads as follows. Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal. They have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds the earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axemen. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he who I am set below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way that they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, and etc., But tell to beware, let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axemen. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you are lenient think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not like jazz, that do not jazz it out that night on specific Tuesday, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be, the worst spirit that has ever existed in fact or realm of fantasy, the Axeman. Okay, so there's so many weird shit about this letter right now. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt the first time I read over it. He, so he thinks he's a spirit. And a devil. And a demon. Right. From hell. But he uses old English in the mixture. But he only uses it at like the very end. Which is right. Weird. Okay, so I just... I just kind of think he is insane in the membrane. I mean, well, I'm, I mean, you've got to be to just go around and hack people to death with axes. But we are assuming, the world is assuming that it came from him. Yeah. Now, granted, it's my understanding that the killings did stop. Eventually. After this letter? Yeah. Okay. So, they... S- you know, they just, it, they began suddenly, and they stopped suddenly. And, but this letter was kind of like the end of... Near the end. Okay. Yeah. Because I think he believe, I believe he went till March, ni- or no, October 1919. And this letter was in March. So you'll... Yeah. I'll get into it. 
Crime writer Colin Wilson speculates the Axeman could have been a Joseph Monfrey, a man shot to death in Los Angeles in December of 1920, by the widow of Mike Pipitone, the Axeman's last known victim. Oh, so maybe someone remembered or recognized Yeah, and some their wife assailant? got some revenge. Okay. Apparently. Well, theorized, anyway. Wilson's theory has been widely repeated in other true crime books and websites. However, true crime writer Michael Newton, searching New Orleans and Los Angeles' public police and court records, as well as newspaper archives, failed to find any evidence of a man named Joseph Monfrere or a, sim- or a similar name having been assaulted or killed anywhere in Los Angeles. Newton was also not able to find any information that Miss Pepitone identified in some sources as Esther Almarino and others simply as a woman who claimed to be Pepitone's widow had been arrested, tried, or convicted for such a crime, or indeed had even been in California. Newton notes that Monfrey was not an unusual surname in New Orleans at the time of the crimes. It it actually sounds kind of French. Yeah, which makes sense because... It's New Orleans. Yeah. It appears that there actually may have been an individual named Joseph Monfrey or Monfrey in New Orleans who had a criminal history and who may have been connected with organized crime. However, local records for the period are not extensive enough to allow confirmations of this. Well, it just seems like there, the gaps in the research and in the information collected yeah, with regards to the law enforcement's mm-hmm. investigation. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and again, to be fair, this was, you know, again, back in 1919. Right, where I'm fairly certain that crime like this was not prevalent. No, definitely not. Wilson's explanation is considered an urban legend, and there is no more evidence now on the identity of the killer than there had been at the time of the crimes. So basically someone came up with this theory and everybody bought it? Yep. Without proof? Yeah. Okay. Two of the alleged early victims of the Axemen, an Italian couple with the last name, I apologize in advance, (laughs) Shammy Bra? were shot by an intruder in their lower Ninth Ward home in the early morning hours of May 16th, 1912. The husband survived. The wife did not. In newspaper accounts, the prime suspect was referred to by the name of Monfrey more than once. While radically different than the Axeman's usual modus operandi, if Joseph Monfrey was indeed the Axeman, the Chimambras may have been his first victims. A scholar named Richard Warner believes that the chief suspect in the crimes was Frank Doc Mumfrey, who used the alias Lean Joseph Monfrey. So relatively close. Yes. And so that would explain maybe this particular theory. Yes. But you said that they were shot. So they weren't shot. They were just, they were, oh yeah, they were shot by an intruder. Um, And so it's completely different than the Axeman's normal modus operandi. So I'm not really sure why they decided to connect. Associate the two. Yeah. Okay, and this was March of 20, I'm sorry, March of 1912. Uh, May, May 16th. May 16th, okay. So that was quite a few years before the majority of his... The onslaught begins. Yeah, because he, I believe, began in 1918, is what they suspect. So now we're going to go through a list of victims. His first victim was Joseph Maggio, an Italian grocer and his wife Catherine, who were attacked on May 23rd, 1918 while sleeping alongside each other at their home on the corner of Upper Line and Magnolia. The killer broke into the home and then proceeded to cut the couple's throats with a straight razor. Upon leaving, he bashed their heads in with an axe, perhaps in order to conceal the real cause of death. Joseph initially survived the attack, but died a few minutes after being discovered by his brothers, Jack and Andrew. In the apartment, law enforcement agents found the bloody clothes of the murderer as he had been obviously changed into a clean set of clothes before fleeing the scene. A complete search of the premises was not completed by police after the bodies were removed, yet later the bloody razor was found in the lawn of a neighboring property. So, I mean, to be fair, yeah. this type of crime was not, but I mean, common sense dictates you kind of just search the area to see. Yeah, yeah at the very least, like a, like a curiously, like just or even like surface like, level glance. Correct. I mean, Something. Ha- how many times has the the very important case been cracked by a stupid mistake, a wallet left behind, a, fi- a fingerprint left behind. Or, yeah, the, the smoking gun, as so, they call it. 
did the did they speculate that the killer brought his own clothes or changed into the victim's clothes? His own clothes. So he came prepared. Yes. Police ruled out robbery as motivation for the attacks, as money and valuables left in plain sight were not stolen. The razor used to kill the couple was found to belong to Andrew Maggio, who owned a barber shop on Camp Street. For the brother. Right. You know, that just seems so particular because, but it is assumption on my part that he didn't come into the, the house without a weapon, but what a motherfucking insult to use a weapon already in the home. Oh, yeah. And the brothers. Yeah. Like he's almost like setting up the brother. Attempting to, sounds like. His employee, Esteban Torres, told police that Andrew had removed the razor from his shop two days prior to the murder, explaining that he had wanted to have a nick honed from the blade. Andrew, who lived in the adjoining apartment, discovered his slain brother and sister-in-law roughly two hours after the gruesome attacks had occurred. Andrew blamed his failure to hear any noise related to the attacks on his intoxicated state, as he had returned home after a night of celebration prior to his departure to join the Navy. Police, however, were nonetheless surprised to s- that he failed to hear the intruder as he made a forced entry into the home. Andrew became the police's prime suspect in the crime, yet was released after investigators were unable to break down his statement, as well as his account of an unknown man who was supposedly seen lurking near the residence prior to the murders. So he bashes in the door. Yeah. Like a home invasion scenario. Yeah. The neighbors don't hear? Yeah, the brother who's in the very next apartment didn't hear because he was passed out drunk. Okay. Yeah. Second victim was Catherine Maggio, the wife. The wife. Her throat was cut so deeply that her head was nearly severed. See, that's, like, brutal. Yeah. Like, he has anger issues. Oh, absolutely. Unlike Joseph, she did not survive long after the attack, if at all, and died before her husband's brothers found them. Victim number three is a Louis Bussummer. Louis and his mistress, Harriet Lowe, were attacked in the early morning hours of June 27, 1918, in the living space at the back of his grocery, which was located at the corner of Doregios and Le Harp. This summer was struck with a hatchet above his right temple, which resulted in a possible skull fracture. Lowe was hacked over the left ear and found unconscious when police arrived at the scene. Discovered shortly after 7 a.m. by John Zanka, a driver of a bakery wagon who had come to the store in order to make a routine delivery. They were both found in a puddle of their own blood, both bleeding from their heads. The axe, which had belonged to Bissummer, was found in the bathroom of the apartment. Bissummer later stated to police that he had been sleeping when he was attacked with the hatchet. Almost immediately, police arrested potential suspect Louis Abicon, a 41-year-old African-American man who had been employed in Bissummer's store. No evidence existed which could have proved the man guilty, yet police arrested him nonetheless, stating that Abicon had offered a conflicting account of his whereabouts on the morning of the attack. Shortly after the attempted murder, Lowe stated that she remembered having been attacked by a mixed-race man, yet her statement was discounted due to her delusion state. Robbery was said to be the only possible explanation for the attacks, yet no money or valuables were removed from the couple's home. Obicon was later released as police were unable to gather sufficient evidence to hold him accountable for the crimes. I mean, you can't just arrest... They probably just arrested him because he was black. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, say. no evidence. None no. tie him to this, and you're just like, eh, it's that dude. Is this guy. Is yeah. this guy. Media attention soon turned to Bessemer himself as a series of letters written in German, Russian, and Yiddish were discovered in the trunk at the man's home. Police suspected that Bessemer was a German spy and government officials began a full investigation to, of his potential espionage. This was March, or I'm sorry. 1918. 1918. So we're, we're actually in World War One at this yeah. point. So as a spy, he felt it was best to hack himself. To hack himself and his mistress. Did he survive? Yes. Did, and she did not. She survived the attack. She died later due to complications of surgery. So he hacks himself in bed. And her. He, then he hacks her. <laughs> or let's say he even hacked her first. Yeah. Probably did. Probably hacked her first and then was like, oh, shit, I got to cover myself. <laughs> but he probably went to the bathroom, hacked himself in the bathroom, dropped it in the tub. You said they found it in the bathroom tub? Yeah. Or bathroom? Yeah. And then he stumbled his way back <laughs> to... Th- 
the, while he's bleeding profusely with a skull and fracture. And cleaning it up as he goes along because he can't leave the trace of blood because that would be an obvious indication that oh, he yeah. did it. Them damn German spies. Sneaky Because bastards. that's how he's going to get away <laughs> with treason. That's how they do treason now. Some sneaky, sneaky German bastards. Correct. <laughs> Weeks later, after going in and out of uh, consciousness, Harriet Lowe told police that she thought Miss Summer was in fact a German spy, which led to his immediate arrest. Did they translate the letters? I could never find anything that said if they did or not. Okay, so they arrest him, and then what happens? Two days later, Miss Summer was released, and the two lead investigators of the case were demoted due to unacceptable police work. Well, thank God. No shit. Someone's like... You're doing a shitty job. You're demoted. Bye. He was arrested again in August of 1918 after Harriet Lowe, who lay dying at Chantry Hospital after a failed surgery, stated that it was he who had attacked her. He was charged with the, uh, with her murder and served nine months in prison before being acquitted on May 1st, 1919, after a 10-minute jury deliberation. Like, that's legal. Yeah. Just so you know, in California, they have to deliberate at least... A minimum one hour. Correct. This was also, again, back in 19... Correct. And we're talking the South. The South. That was... It was a whole different world. And we're talking a really (laughs) whole different world in in the early 1900s. (laughs) Fourth victim, Harriet Lowe. As mentioned previously, she was hacked above her left ear and found unconscious. Became the center of a media circus as she continually made scandalous and often false statements. The Times pick again. Wait, so she's living large? She's living large with this attention? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Times pick again sensationalized Lowe and her outspoken nature upon discovering that she was not the wife of Miss Summer, but his mistress. His legal wife arrived from Cincinnati in the days immediately following the discovery, which further inflamed the ongoing drama. She gained further media attention as she repeatedly made statements which voiced her dislike of the New Orleans chief of police, as well as her reluctance to comply with police questioning. Despite the scandal in her delirious statements which suggested that Bissomer was a German spy, Lowe returned to the home she shared with him weeks after the attack. One side of her Oh, fa- so wait. She's like, sorry, baby, I accused you of trying to kill you me? You German spy that tried to murder me? Let me go back on this house. Right, like... <laughs> and he took her back? People be dumb. <laughs> and his wife was like, it's okay? People be dumb. I... <laughs> I I don't get it. One side of her face was partially paralyzed due to the severity of the attack, and Lowe ended up dying on August 5th, 1918, just two days after doctors performed surgery in an effort to repair her face. Just prior to her death, Lowe told authorities that she suspected that it was Bissomer who had attacked her. Do we have a picture of her? Have you seen pictures of her? I have not. Okay, so she died a result of the failed surgery, not because of the injuries. Well... The injuries caused the surgery when the surgery caused the death. Right. So, kind of in a roundabout way, kind of. Victim number five was an Anna Scheidinger, attacked in the early evening hours of August 5th, 1918. The eighth-month pregnant, 28-year-old Anna Scheidinger awoke to find a dark figure standing over her and was bashed in the face repeatedly. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. Her scalp had been cut open and her face was completely covered in blood. Discovered after midnight by her husband, Ed Scheider, who was re- returning late from work. Claimed that she remembered nothing of the attack and gave birth to a healthy baby girl two days after. She lived? She lived and gave birth and the baby was perfectly fine. But two the baby after. was eight months. So she was, eight, well, uh, yeah, I mean. So, so a little preemie, a, a little but the pre- baby but did all right. But the baby was healthy and. Of course. Yeah. Her husband told police that nothing was stolen from the home besides six or seven dollars that had been in his wallet. The windows and doors of the apartment appear to have not been forced open. And Wait a minute. He was supposedly at work. What the hell is his wallet doing there? Mm-hmm. Maybe he just forgot it. I've done it. Okay. <laughs> the windows and doors of the apartment appear to have not been forced open, and authorities came to the conclusion that the woman was most likely attacked with a lamp that had been on a nearby table. So they think they got him through the she the the axeman got through the window. Yeah, and then bashed her face with a lamp, and then she survived. And she survived. I mean, shit. 
people were fucking tough. Hell like yeah. if I even see a bee or you know whatever. <laughs> I'm not that bad with bees. Spiders, on the other hand, I'll cry. Okay. <laughs> you guys know what to get her for Christmas. Shit. <laughs> James Gleason, who police said was an ex-convict, was arrested shortly after Schrodinger was found. He was later released due to a complete lack of evidence and stated that he originally ran from the authorities because he had been so often arrested. Lead investigators began to publicly speculate that the attack was related to the previous in- incidences involving Bissummer and Maggio. So they're linking them. Yeah, finally after the third one. After this guy who's like, I got nothing to do with it, but I'm running anyways? Well, because he had been arrested so often, which I think well, is kind of like an automatic. Right. But still, maybe you shouldn't be a criminal. Just a thought. You know, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. But <laughs> Victim number six was a Joseph Romano, an elderly man living with his two nieces, Pauline and Mary Bruno. On August 10th, 1918, Pauline and Mary awoke to the sound of a commotion in the adjoining room where their uncle resided. Upon entering the room, the sisters discovered that their uncle had taken a serious blow to his head, which resulted in two open cuts. The assailant was fleeing the scene as they arrived. Yet the girls were able to distinguish that he was a dark-skinned, heavy-set man who wore a dark suit and a slouched hat. Romano, although seriously injured, was able to walk to the ambulance once it arrived, yet died two days later due to severe head trauma. The home had been ransacked, yet no items were stolen. Authorities found a bloody axe in the backyard and discovered that a panel on the back door had been chiseled away. You know, this one actually seems out of standard... His standard victim. Yeah. Yeah. It not only is it a male, but it's an elderly male. Mm-hmm. And there's two women in the house. I wonder if I was to speculate, I wonder if he killed him with the intent to kill the two nieces. He just didn't get a chance. Probably. That's what I would have, you know. Like get assume. the male out of the way first. Yeah. And then I think because of such a loud commotion and the girls woke up, he heard them probably moving in the house and panicked and. Right, and fled the scene. Yeah. The Romano murder created a state of extreme chaos in the city, with residents living in constant fear of an Axeman attack. Police received a slew of reports in which citizens claimed to have seen an Axeman lurking in New Orleans neighborhoods. What what does an Axeman look like? Right? I mean, like... (laughs) Like, when I think of Axeman, it's like like lumberjack. Correct, plaid, plaid, with the hat, and and the jeans, and and the suspenders. you know, blue. His ox right next to him. <laughs> Tall bunion. Yeah, that's it. Seer and I'd be driving like, there's an X Men. There's right. an X Men. <laughs> Especially up where we live. We're in the middle of the woods in the mountains. X Men everywhere. They, they don't dress that way. <laughs> I don't know don't. what an X Men looks like. <laughs> I mean, they're normally wearing like camo, but. Yeah. <laughs> There's a fashionista right there. (laughs) A few men even called to report that they had found axes in their backyards. John D'Antonio, a retired Italian detective, made public statements in which he hypothesized that the man who had committed the Axeman murders was the same who had killed several individuals in 1911. He cited similarities in the manner by which the two sets of homicides had been committed as reason to assume that they had been conducted by the same individual. D'Antonio described the potential killer as an individual of dual personalities who wi- who killed without motive. This type of individual, he stated, could very likely have been a normal, law-abiding citizen who was often overcome by an overwhelming desire to kill. He later went on to describe the killer as a real-life Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde. Um, that's a pretty in-depth description. It's like he's profiling. He's yeah. starting the concept of profiling. Because yeah. that was before profiling was even a thing. Correct. Correct. Now, he, you said that he related them to crimes that occurred in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. In 1911. So we're talking approximately seven, eight years prior. Yeah, then there was a gap in the 1918. So, like, so... A lot of people mistake Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde who was who. Yeah. So the doctor was, you know, he created the potion. Yes. So it seemed like maybe his his bad inner demons went dormant mm-hmm. or he was in jail. Or, yeah, something happened. Or he was abroad. Yeah. 
Or he could have been like in the army. Who knows? Right. And he was serving. I mean, not two thousand. Uh, I'm sorry, nineteen eleven. Yeah. I'm not sure if we're in World War One at that point. No, I think we're a couple years from that. So not many, but right. But I mean, he could have been a merchant marine, which would have gone. Yeah. yeah. Like not necessarily. So I mean, there's a variety of valid reasons, and or like I said, that personality, the killer personality, just went dormant. Yeah, especially so. if he had like a dual personality, like uh, D'Antonio seems to think he had. Victims seven, eight, and nine were a Charles, Rosie, and Mary Fortemilgula, an Italian immigrant who lived with his wife Rosie and infant daughter Mary. Oh, yeah. On the night of March 10th, 1919, screams were heard coming from the Camigula residence. A neighbor, Orlando Giordano, rushed across the street to investigate. Upon his arrival, he noticed that Charles, his wife, and their daughter had all been attacked by the unknown intruder. Rosie stood in the doorway with a serious head wound, clutching her deceased daughter. Charles lay on the floor, bleeding profusely. The couple was rushed to the charity hospital, where it was discovered that both had suffered skull fractures. Nothing was stolen from the house, but a panel on the back door had been chiseled away and a bloody axe was found on the back porch of the home. Charles was released two days later while his wife remained in the care of doctors. Upon regaining full consciousness, Rosie made claims that Orlando Giordano and his 18-year-old son Frank were responsible. Orlando, a 69-year-old man, was in too poor of health to have committed the crimes. Frank, more than six feet tall and weighing over 200 pounds, would have been too large to fit through the panel in the back door. Charles vehemently denied his wife's claims, yet police arrested the two and charged them with a murder and attack. But uh, both would be later found guilty. Frank was sentenced to hang and his father to life in prison. Oh, my God. So these two people who couldn't possibly commit the murders. And who rushed over because he heard the screams and was trying to help the family. So basically the first people she sees. Yeah. What a tragedy. Charles divorced his wife after the trial. Almost a year later, Rosie announced that she had falsely accused the two out of jealousy and spite. Yeah. I would have divorced that bitch, too. Mm-hmm. Hell, yeah. Her statement was the only evidence against the Jordanios, and they were both released from jail shortly after. Oh, so they didn't die. No, but I mean, they still... But still, I mean, they, oh, year, this bitch straight, so straight pointed a finger yeah, and almost got away with it. And almost got one of them killed for it. Oh, my God. And well, they still wasted a year of their life. A year. Yes. And especially at 69 years old back then? Shit, that's like the very end. Not only that, but I mean, we're not talking. People, I just, once your reputation was soiled. Oh, absolutely. It was fucking over for you. Yeah. That, I don't know how it happened, but your reputation followed you everywhere. Correct. Even though, I mean, we're not talking, you know, things didn't move as fast as they do now. I mean, one yeah. picture and your whole fucking life is over. That's it. But what a, what a, what a fucking cunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's I mean, I could see you, being upset that she lost her baby. Well, yeah. But to adamantly push that somebody killed your child, your child, when you know that they didn't. That's a fucking new level, lady. Out of jealousy and spite. She divor- deserved to be divorced. Ugh. Victim number 10, Steve Boca. He was attacked in his bedroom as he slept on August 10th, 1919. He awoke during the night to find a dark figure looming over his bed. Upon regaining consciousness, Boca ran to the street to investigate the intrusion and found that his head had been cracked open. So he didn't even know. He had no idea. He just... he. Was bashed in the head, lost consciousness, woke up and was like, where the hell's this dude at? Shit, my head. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. He ran to the home of his neighbor, Frank Janassa, where he lost consciousness again and collapsed. Nothing had been taken, and the back door panel was again chiseled out. Yeah, but he's a male. Yeah. I don't know if, like, maybe, like, if he didn't canvas this place as well as probably the other ones did. He did. He, did this guy live with a female? And I never found anything that said that. So maybe the accent thought he did. Right. And then he got in, thought, saw just saw just Steve in his bed, and he was like, ah, shit. Well, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm here. He's I'm here. here. <laughs> I got the accent in hand. Let's, well. let's wrap this up. 
Boca recovered but could not remember any details. The attack actually took place after the emergence of that infamous letter from earlier. Okay, so that was the last victim? Nope. Oh. We're getting, uh, we have two more. Two more victims. Number 11 was a Sarah Lawman. She was attacked on the night of September 3rd, 1919. Neighbors came to check on the young woman who lived alone and broke into the home when Lawman did not answer. They discovered the 19-year-old laying unconscious in her bed, suffering from a severe head injury and missing several teeth. The intruder had entered the apartment through an open window and attacked her with a blunt object. A bloody axe was discovered in the front lawn of the building. She recovered and yet could not recall any details from the attack. So, you know, I'm wondering, are we certain there's no copycats? That, I mean, that could be a thing, but... I, I mean, because it's... Yeah, because some of these, some of them don't follow the exact MO. Right. Again... He, I mean, they're close, but they're just slightly off. Okay. Last victim. Last victim, number 12, a Mike Pipitone. He was attacked on the night of October 27th, 1919. His wife was awakened by a noise and arrived at the door of his bedroom just as a large axe-wielding man was fleeing the scene. Mike had been struck in the head and was covered in his own blood. Blood splatter covered the majority of the room, including a painting of the Virgin Mary. Mrs. Pepitone was unable to describe any characteristics of the killer, and the Pepitone murder was the last of the alleged axeman attacks. He disappeared after that. No creepy-ass letter? No creepy ass letter, no other murders, just disappeared. Again, we are assuming that the letter came from the axeman himself. Yeah. Which, and I mean, we've had people send in letters. Right, Zodiac. During like, yeah, during like a serial killer kind of thing just to get the attention. and. Right. I actually, they, it's been leaked to the FBI, or I think it was the FBI. Mm-hmm who truly believed was the Zodiac. And in the world of true crime, Mm -hmm. totally getting off topic now, (laughs) Ted Kaczynski killed himself. Yeah. The Unabomber. Yeah, that was just recently, He checked himself out like two days ago. Yeah. Guess he had enough. Mm -hmm. But he was also in one of the United States' most, like, strictest, sturgent... Yeah. Uh, facility where he belonged. Correct. So, I mean, psh, thank you for saving me and my tax dollars. Right. For sure. But either way, off topic. Okay, so <laughs> I had asked in the beginning whether or not they had preserved any of the evidence simply because, you know, over time, mm-hmm. they're they're literally going back. They They believe they have now solved who... Jack the Ripper was. Yeah, I mean, they're going back, solving all these cold cases. Correct. And, you know, I couldn't find anything that said... The X-Men has gotten any attention. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, this isn't over. If if someone, if New Orleans finally gets, you know, an, an inkling of maybe we should take a look at this. Yes. You know, I, I don't think this... Who knows? Yeah. I mean, and it won't... I mean, obviously, it won't change anything because it happened... Over a hundred years ago, correct. But like family members of the victim, there'll be closure. Would have closure. I mean, a baby died too. Well, you know, a baby died. Yeah, needlessly. Mm-hmm. And here again, are we sure it was him? I mean, yeah. But like I said, the one in the tub because the because the weapons were found elsewhere. Yeah, as he was fleeing, that just seems real questionable to me. Well, and the, I don't know that whole one was just. Fucking wild and weird anyway, Mr. Russian spy, because he had German and Russian and Yiddish letters. and Right. Wife, or, well, not wife, mistress over here who was, you know, smacked in the head. Couldn't really probably think straight. No, nope, like, but she was oh. Nick loving it until she died. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, before we start our usual closing scenario. Yes. I'd like to take a moment to let our listeners know that Where the Dark Corners Are is actually sponsoring a trivia night Yes, at a place called Bottle and Brush, in, located in Susanville, on Thursday, July 13th at 
you do want to kind of get there a little bit earlier to get, yeah. I guess, situated would be my guess. And as far as I know, a few of us actually will be there. Mm-hmm. I will be there. Our, I don't, I'm not to put you on the spot. I'm hoping to. We'll see. My work's doing some weird trainings, like after, like work hours. Right. Should hopefully be done before then. We'll uh, see. Okay. So it it basically be your opportunity to kind of meet us if you are curious and or interested. Yeah. But either way, come out. We by sponsoring. So this is what we've done. We're adding fifty dollars to the cash pot because. Mm-hmm. Here's how it works. The more people show up, the bigger the cash pot is. And we have donated for Funko Pop superhero Mm -hmm. action figures because the theme is um, superheroes. Yes. The theme is superheroes. So if if superheroes are your jam, (laughs) then this is your opportunity to to shine. Yeah, come win some money, come hang out with some cool peoples. Right. Correct. So, just something to think about. <laughs> All right, so on to business. Facebook, 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 where the Dark Corners are, has a Facebook page. So if you like to share some creepy things, see some creepy things, or even, you know, do some suggestions for some uh, future episodes, go ahead and send us a request over to that Facebook page. Or the email. Or the email. At where the Dark Corners are, or, well... Send it to where the dark corners are at gmail.com. And corners is uh, plural. No. Yes. Yes. Plural. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it, may, it may or may not kick it back. There you go. But in the meantime, like she said, if you have a topic that you'd like us to cover, because mm-hmm. like I said, there's a lot of shit going down, I think, now that the weather's gotten a little bit better. Yes. Things are starting to heat up around America and the world. Yes. And so, you know, you want us to cover something? Yeah, give me some serial killers to talk about. Right. She's got books, folks. I do. I have she's notebooks and notebooks. So, <laughs> she's ready. <laughs> I is. So, final thoughts? It's kind of crazy how I, they have absolutely, like, really no clue who this guy was. Right. And again, we're assuming it's a man. I mean, it is a big assumption. Yeah. Because how big is the door panel? I mean, yeah, but... I mean, typically, and it's not always the case, but typically it takes a lot of force with an axe, and like even with like the doll end of an axe, to fracture a skull. Yes. You know, and I'm not saying that, you know, those of the female biology, like biological, couldn't do it. I could. Well, I wonder if he chiseled the panel to reach the doorknob to unlock it. Maybe that's how it went down. Oh, yeah. Shoot, that'd be way easier. Hell. Okay. Reach up. Either way. It's really solved there, probably. (laughs) All right. So until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is where we hope to meet you where the dark corners are.